Hello, I'm John Gatto, and I travel by the name John Taylor Gatto for reasons I'll explain in a minute. Uh, I was a New York City public school teacher for 30 years, and I resigned from school teaching on the op-ed page of the Wall Street Journal in 1991. And since that time, I've traveled one and a half million miles in all 50 states and eight foreign countries trying to arrest the career of the institution of government schooling. One of the really useful pieces of research that I've engaged in for the past 11 or 12 years is studying the 18 or 20 elite private boarding schools that set the tone for approximately 300 such schools and produce a substantial chunk of our national leadership. I don't think there are many people aware of the fact that in the 2000 presidential election that four of the six finalists for the presidency went to one or another of these schools. George Bush went to Andover. Uh, John McCain went to Episcopal High. Steve Forbes went to Brooke. And Al Gore, I think Gore went to St. Andrews, but if you let me look at my note, uh, St. Albans in Washington, D.C. Uh, these schools only graduate about a thousand kids a year. This is a nation of 300 million, and yet four of the six finalists for the presidency attended schools that only graduate a thousand a year. So I thought there might be some real utility in finding out what these schools teach as opposed to what public schools teach. And that job proved to be much easier than I thought. So I'd like to share with you the 14 principles that I discovered that are universal among these schools. Even though each is quite a different animal than the next, they all concentrate on these 14 themes. The first of these themes is that no good kid should graduate without a theory of human nature. What makes people tick? What buttons do you press to get the results from your fellow man and woman that you want? And where does the fund of lore come from? Not from psychology, not even in a small way. The fund of lore about human nature comes from history, philosophy, theology, that's a curse word, isn't it, in public schooling, literature, and law. These five mighty agencies of human history and the human mind have a wealth of information about what human beings are like now, have been like, and probably always will be like. And every kid is expected to have a degree of expertise drawn from these sources. I guess I should say these databases. The second requirement of these schools is that every graduate have a strong experience with the act of literacies. Now, we're all familiar with literacy as some exercise in reading, but the act of literacies are writing and public speaking. No matter how well developed your mind becomes on strong texts, it's useless to convince anyone else of your point of view unless you can write well and you can speak well. I think we've come to this juncture in history believing that that's some 
God-given gift that only a few people have, I can guarantee you, as a school teacher for 30 years, that both of those skills are extremely easy to teach. To teach public speaking, you simply have to offer regular opportunities to speak before a group of strangers. That could be a group as small as one, two, or three, or it could be an auditorium full of strangers. But the fact that they're not people that you feel comfortable with, I think is essential. To write well, it requires nothing more than that you write constantly and regularly, every day, preferably. The improvement will occur quite naturally. At that point, you might be able to profitably use some expert intervention, but in the process of reaching competency, intervention is the worst possible thing, simply the practice of doing it. So now we have a theory of human nature and skill in the act of literacies. Number three uh, among the curriculum themes that unite these elite private boarding schools is insight into the major institutional forms like our courts or our corporations or our military, including details of the ideas which drive them. I want to give you one sample of this so you can see how, how seriously uh, government schools fall short of the mark in offering insight into these institutions. Uh, we have all heard endlessly in schools of separation of powers, that the governance of the United States is divided into at least three compartments, one an executive compartment, one a legislative compartment, that further divided into two compartments of its own, and finally a judicial department. Now, a little bit of reflection should show you what the purpose of that is. Not that we all live in harmony and agree in times of trouble with what to say and do, but exactly the opposite of that. That the only possible way to arrive at an approximation of truth is through argument. The more skillful the argument on all sides, the better for the, the ultimate result of truth. So that people who appear before you in the media and say, in this time of trouble, dissent is not wanted, are truly un-American because this country was the world's first laboratory of dissent on the part of everybody. That's really what the American dream is largely composed of, the ability to speak your mind in a public forum. So that kind of understanding, which is, is kept under close wraps in public schooling, is examined minutely in these elite private boarding schools. There are many, many other uh, working engines of our institutions that we're not allowed to understand. I might contradict myself and give you one more. The military, which is quite an expensive institution to maintain, even in times of peace, is always constituted at the fraction of one to one and a half percent of the entire adult male population. Never heard that before. That was a rule or a principle worked out in Prussian Germany several hundred years ago. Now your homework is to find out why that fraction, but I'll give you a clue. 
the prison population in the United States is very close to the military population in the United States, and that fraction, too, was worked out in Prussian Germany about 200 years ago. So you should expect the teachers that impact on your kids to be aware of these things and hundreds more like them and to make that the meat of their their contact with kids and if you're homeschooling do your homework and that's not meant to be sarcastic you'll grow each time you add one of these concepts to your own mental base the fourth thing that private schools do, or elite private boarding schools do, that public schools hardly touch are the repeated exercises in the forms of good manners and politeness based on the utter truth that politeness and civility is the foundation of all future relationships, all future alliances, access to places that you might want to go there. Now, don't tell me, well, that's just common sense, because any public school I've ever been in, and I've been in hundreds, is a laboratory of rudeness, cruelty, sloppiness, coarseness. The fifth thing that private boarding schools emphasize is independent work. Think again about the possible reasons for that. In public schools as we know them, the teacher is charged with about 80 to 90 percent of the of filling the time uh, available, one way or another, and all the choices of the teachers. But in independent private boarding education, that ratio ideally is reversed. It probably never is completely reversed. But the weighting is shockingly different. The kids do most of the work. They're expected to do most of the work. They're expected to be resourceful enough to use the work of other kids also not in public school. The sixth principle is that energetic physical sports aren't a luxury or a way to blow off steam, but they're absolutely the only way to confer grace on the human presence. And that that grace translates into power and to money later on. Uh, I was talking to David yesterday about the perception of George Washington as a very average mind among his own contemporaries, but nobody said that his physical presence was average. Washington in his diaries tells us that the two most important things that made him George Washington were deliberately selected. One was horseback riding and the other was ballroom dancing because it, it conferred a commanding physical presence on the person who could, who could uh, uh, do those things well. Also sports teach you practice in handling pain in dealing with emergencies which occur regularly in sports. The seventh curricular theme in elite private boarding schools is a complete theory of access to any workplace or any person. You'd do better off than reading a civics textbook to set the kid set a kid the challenge of getting a private meeting with the mayor of Los Angeles and let him work for a year 
on constructing an access to the mayor. Does that sound fanciful to you? My kids from a very ordinary New York public school got access not only to New York City's mayor, but to New York State's governor and CEOs beyond count. You can do that too. Teach your kid how to access places and people that he or she wants or needs. Number eight is responsibility as an utterly essential part of the curriculum. Now, yes, that includes things like washing dishes, but in elite private boarding schools, you ask a kid to care for a horse, to take some important community service, to go for leadership in clubs, much easier to get than you think because if the club is actually doing anything, it's a lot of hard work to be the leader and very few people want that. Always to grab for responsibility when it's offered and always to deliver more than is asked for. Number nine, and this is a long range comprehensive thing that needs to be checked regularly, but you don't ever quite get there. It's arrival at a personal code of standards. Those are standards in production, standards in behavior, and standards in morality. Number 10 is a familiarity with the master creations in music, in painting, in dance, in sculpture, in design, in architecture, in literature, in drama. To be at ease with the arts because apart from religion, the arts are the only way to transcend the animal materiality of our lives, to get in touch with a bigger you. Number 11 is the power of accurate observation and recording. I'll only give you one example of how you think this way, and if you push yourself, you will be able to supply many more. Power of accurate observation and recording. It used to be an axiom among the British upper classes that if you could not draw what you saw with your eye, then you, in fact, were not seeing what was there. So drawing wasn't a way to kill time, but a way to sharpen the perception. Charles Darwin, not my favorite human being, but nevertheless a major name in intellectual history over the past 150 years. If Charles Darwin had not been able to skillfully draw, then no one would have attended to his well-articulated theory of the evolution of the favored races. Look at the title of the book. It usually left out that part. But don't let me editorialize here. Modern science, in some very great regard, has only been possible through graphic representations, drawing and photography. Number 12 is the ability to deal with challenges of all sorts. Now this one's my favorite because one person's challenge is another person's ho-hum. To know what will challenge your son or your daughter you have to know your son or daughter very, very well. If you have a kid who's painfully shy, obviously public presentations are the challenge that the kid needs as a corrective to uh, rather than live the rest of uh, their lives. If you're 
Child is a coward. That's a harsh word. But many people are natural cards. Maybe all of us are natural cards until we come to see that physical challenges really aren't so bad. And if they hurt, they don't hurt that much. Teach your kid if he gets knocked down, always to stand back up. If he gets knocked down again, to stand back up again. That would be a challenge. But challenges are different for different people there. If you're used to eating garbage food at the fast food outlets, I guess it will be a challenge to train your palate to discriminate fresh food and excellence in preparation from, from a Big Mac. I guess I only picked that one because my wife a, is a superb cook and she graduated from the Culinary Institute in Hyde Park. See, Janet, I told you I wouldn't forget you. Uh, number 13, we're coming to the end of this, this curricular list, is a habit of caution in reasoning to conclusions. Should Iraq be invaded by the most technologically sophisticated military in the history of the planet, and should hundreds of billions of dollars be allotted to that purpose? Well, maybe it should and maybe it shouldn't. But listening to a few government propaganda hours about the similarities between the leader of Iraq and Adolf Hitler is not the way to come to the conclusion, even though it's the way that 80 or 90 percent of us do. And finally, is the constant development and testing of judgment. You make judgments, you discriminate value, and then you follow up. You keep an eye on your predictions to see how far skewed from what actually occurs, think, or, or how consistent with what transpires things are. Now, this might not be the totality of a great curriculum, but let me tell you from where I sit there, this is well worth considering long and hard as a diet for, for your own school practice. One of the great anomalies of the teaching business is the disconnect in awareness or the awareness disconnect between academic endeavor and the world of work, the job market. It's sort of implied that if you acquire a good academic record, that the world will take care of you later on, which I think is, is a very questionable assertion. Nevertheless, even if it were not a questionable assertion, I think you'll find what I'm going to say next interesting. I wrote to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, and I, I had read that they do projections about what jobs will be commonest in the economy of uh, a decade ahead. And I asked for the latest one of those. I said, well, what, what will be the most abundant jobs in the United States? And the list I got back will supply, I think, surprise you quite as much as it surprised me. The single commonest occupation in the United States will be retail salesperson, a clerk in a store. Now, quick, go over the 12 years of schooling that you probably had. Maybe add to it the four or six years of college you tacked on top of that. 
And tell me exactly what part of that experience is relevant to being a retail salesperson. Was your trigonometry or geometry or calculus, is that relevant? How about your memorizing the periodic table of elements? Is that men to laugh, David? Okay, the number two job in the United States will be registered nurse, which is kind of interesting. I've always felt in my own life that the nurse was far more important a part of the medical team than the doctors I encountered, present company accepted there. Uh, but once again, if you try to find a fit between the, the diet, the scholastic diet, and what's required of a nurse, there's a, there's a bit of a disconnect. The third most important job in the United States will be cashier. I don't need to comment on that. Number four is general office clerk, which speaks for itself. Number five is a job that's always intrigued me. I wish I had gone for it. It's truck driver. But once again, it's hard for me to see what the 12 years invested and the enormous amount of money uh, represented by that 12 years. In New York State, it's, it's about $11,000 a kid. I believe it's higher than that in California, but... It's certainly the equivalent, times 12. If we took that sum and invested it in kindergarten in the kid's name in some canny investments, maybe real estate, which has been a great investment, I think maybe when after 12 years it could be spent fishing or panning for gold, we could hand the kid a million bucks or so and say, now go get yourself an education somewhere. There's a gigantic part of the gross national product invested in this form of training. There has to be some reasonable theory of applicability to the functions that the national economy requires. The sixth most common job in the United States will be managers. The seventh, janitors, cleaners, and domestic servants. The eighth, nurses' aides, orderlies, and general attendants, ward attendants. The ninth, food counter and related workers. Notice we're not talking about chefs. We're talking about food counter workers. And 10th is the honorable profession that acting could not survive without weight persons. I would prefer to say waiters and waitresses. Now, when you look at that as the projected economy, is it any wonder that schools don't bother to teach writing or public speaking or higher order abstraction or any of a range of what would seem to be wonderfully useful things to learn or interesting things to learn because we don't want to upset the apple cart with our waiters and food counter workers or our truck drivers and cashiers. This is the reality of the economy we have. It's true that if you live in some protected enclaves in the United States, it doesn't seem to be the reality. It's a struggle between deciding to be an engineer or an agency head or, 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 or a doctor or a lawyer. But that isn't the reality for 95% of the country. I'd like to tell you now about 
the techniques I devised to try to break out of this trap, myself as well as the kids, how to break out of the trap of, of these conditioned responses, uh, this dependent thinking. And I had to work out, just for a moment, bear with me and think about my problem. I had 30 kids coming to me five times a day, but not the same 30 kids. So now there are 150 lives I impinge on for about 45 minutes a day. And then these kids, for no rational reason other than that the scheduler would go mad, I don't, go from, from science to gym or from studying history to studying poetry. And if you took the thread of these sequences and just set them down and tried to justify them on any other basis than administrative convenience, it would be impossible to do. The law says they have to be there six hours. You can kill 45 minutes of that time with lunch. You can kill another 20 minutes of that time changing classes. Now you've still got about five hours. And what are you going to do with it? The way we judge each other in the school business is whether it looks like we're doing something worthwhile with it. That means that the kids are in their seat or wiggling their hands in the air or copying notes off a board. Absolutely no one anywhere has any idea whether the quality is transpiring in that time. If you wear a three-piece blue pinstripe suit and a nice shally tie, you just automatically assume to be in league with the professoriate or, or something. Uh, anyway, I had to figure out why. First, I had to figure out what exact forces or pretty exact forces were causing these reams of pathological behavior I was seeing. And that doesn't always mean swinging from the chandelier. It could mean falling asleep, which probably is the same thing to do. But not falling asleep in such a way that the, that the leader of the class sees you, because that's such, such a gruesome insult that usually vengeance is, is called for there. So how was I going to get the kids to develop independent characters and sound characters and independent minds? So I began to work with the mechanical possibilities. One of the first things I did, I hypothesized that the arrangement in long lines and rows, ranks and files, might very well have a, a bad effect on the energy in the people so ranked and filed. Uh, we've all had the experience of sitting around in a circle, and that does seem to release different energies. But I began to experiment with the variety of ways that I could arrange the classroom furniture so as to produce, hopefully, a different kind of psychic result, that the kids would be more into things, that they'd be broken away from their uh, mental fantasies of, of a Big Mac or McDonald's or the porno on the internet, and, and could join in the collective consideration of an idea there. And I came up with about 12, which I won't bore you 
with going through one, two, three, four, five. If you just take 30 little squares of paper and you put it in a confined rectangle, you could get some of the ideas right away and eventually you'd come up with all the ones I did and more. But those would include simply stacking all the furniture in the back of the room and not allowing its use so that you had to crawl or lay on the floor or sit on the floor and so on. So, so that did in fact produce, since I, did, since I changed the furniture every single day, that was when I was young and strong, I changed it every single day, I found that in a very short time, several weeks, there, the classes were coming into my room and they were absolutely expecting, they were more alive and alert than I had ever experienced in my own time. So now what I'm after is some different ways to provoke these responses that are less efforty than moving the furniture every given day. And obviously that's only a small part of, of a whole. The, the first thing I saw as an enemy of, of mental alertness was that we have fixed time, fixed space, fixed sequencing, fixed text to work from. And I decided to make the time, the space, the sequences, and the text completely variable on an individual basis but you had to negotiate with me for it. So a kid could come in who spent all his time drawing comic books in my room, but being pretty discreet about it there. He could come in and say, I want one day a week to go to the public library at a time when no other kids are there during the school day sit in the art section, take down all the resources on graphic art, and put myself to a high-level program of learning perspective and the dynamics of uh, coloring and so on, of, of graphic arts. He would have changed the sequencing, the space, the time, and the text selection of his school day and that was one of the projects that I allowed. I had a standing offer that anyone who wanted to, who was deeply engaged in a piece of work in my room, that I would find space for them, if they chose, to continue that on that work until it was finished or until they were much further along rather than being picked up at the sound of a bell and dropped in a gym class or an art class or a science class or any other class at all, that they could finish what they started. So that was one of the methods that with great success and a lot of political maneuvering that I introduced into my classes. Uh, another thing Another thing that I inserted about midway in my teaching career is that I would create a project, but I would disperse my kids anywhere in New York City that they chose to go in order to complete that project. If you're a fan of Peter Drucker's management books, this would be Drucker's invention of managing by objectives. The executive selects the goal to be uh, a approached and reached, but he does not survey any of the methods at all. He simply says, today we're here, tomorrow we want to be there, get there any way that you can. So some of those things, to give you some examples, one that was outrageously uh, successful was 
recall that my kids were 13 years old. And I said, in five years, which is 1,825 days, some of you go off to college and some of you go off to a job, but all of you are going to have to find a place to live unless you want to hang out at home, which not many of you will want to do. So you're going to get an empty space, and you're going to have to convert it very quickly, all by yourself with no prior experience, into some reasonable approximation of a home so that you won't be ashamed to have friends in or a girlfriend over for dinner or, or whatever. So what you need to do is not only find out what the the objects required for, for, for that are, the, the, the functional ones and then the ones that you would add to realize your personality, but you're going to have to find out approximately what their prices are going to be, then you're going to total the amount of that, and you're going to find yourself facing a whopping bill that very few of you could conceivably hope to reach. But in, rather than me telling you what it is, go anywhere in New York City, I'm going to give you a two-and-a-half-room apartment, and you'll be lucky in New York City to get a two-and-a-half-room apartment. You're probably talking at the cheapest $1,500 a month rent and probably more like $2,000 a month rent. Well, that's $24,000 a year. To get $24,000 after taxes, you have to make, I don't know, $32,000. And then, of course, you have to eat and clothe yourself and get around. So these project-based uh, assignments led to very complex personal decisions and they also led to a to a, a very commonsensical useful project in this case each kid would have a floor plan of an apartment and I made it as uh, as realistic as possible by cutting floor plans of apartments out of uh, uh, the Sunday newspaper real estate sections, and then I would ask them to construct little colored uh, paste-ons for chairs, for sofas, or for whatever else they wanted in the apartment, and they were to submit that to me with an itemized bill and a total sum, including sales tax, that they would require. What we quickly were able to come to the conclusion is that in most of my classes, nobody could do that. I then said, but you will have to do something like that, so you're going to have to be resourceful and figure out how the millions of people turned loose on the work market every year manage to do that. It's true some stay at home for a few years. And it's true that some get a helping hand from their parents, but it's also true that a whole lot of people can't get help from their parents because the help is impossible. So what are some of the other solutions? Teaming up so that three people share the same space cuts the costs considerably for each individual. That's certainly one thing. Improvising the furnishings or scavenging discarded but still useful things from not just from dumpsters but from people who constantly in a commercial economy like this one are ridding themselves of perfectly useful furnishings, air conditioners, you name it, someone is throwing it away at any given time, or virtually throwing it away by selling it for pennies on the dollar. And there are regular sales organs. Now some of them are on the Internet, but there are regular paper sales organs that collect these things. 
As I was driving up to David's today, I passed three lawn sales, and I quickly spotted, if I weren't 3,000 miles away, a couple of pieces of furniture that I'll bet I could have walked away for 10 or 20 bucks with that I would be happy to have back in, in New York. It's just that the airplane might not be happy to provide carriage for it. There are other projects besides this that were really outrageously successful. Uh, one of them was, this was a private one, was analyzing the characteristics of publicly accessible swimming pools. I had a girl who had, was interested in nothing except becoming an Olympic swimmer. Nothing at all. She had no interest in any schoolwork at all. But I said, what are the best public pools in New York City? The five boroughs, I mean, it's 300 square miles. And she said she didn't know. And I said, well, as a swimmer, how would you determine whether a pool was excellent or good or mediocre or bad? And what are the characteristics you'd spot? And she was able to name six or seven of them. And I said, well, suppose you take this checklist that you created and you spend the next couple of months going from swimming pool to swimming pool creating a consumer's guide to public swimming pools in New York City. I said, I would, I would be certain that there would be local magazines interested in paying you to print that maybe even a little guide that could be sold on on bookstalls there. So that was outrageously successful for one person. Uh, one of the things that everyone liked to do was to shadow either their father or their mother or occasionally an uncle or a an older brother or sister, at work. Shadowing means you don't say anything. You travel around with that person and you log exactly what that person is doing. Made 10 phone calls between 9 a.m. and noon. Spent an average of three minutes, shortest 30 seconds, longest eight minutes. Phone, you log everything the person does in their job, and then at lunchtime or after work, you say, I saw you do this. What did this mean? I saw you talk to this person in that office, and you were visibly nervous. Why was that? I learned how to do shadowing from going to the the Department of Labor's two-volume job dictionary, which is in every public library in the United States, and either in the front or the back, it's been so many years, I don't remember. There are pages and pages on how these job descriptions are created. The job dictionary will list every job that you can conceivably imagine and its performance characteristics its access. It's the kind of book that libraries buy and probably no one ever reads, you know, to their, uh, to their loss, I think. But I wasn't interested in the jobs. I was interested in the methodology because I knew I could then sell that as highly professional uh, research work. And we did that. We created a talking job dictionary every year. There were about five years when my interest was high enough to do this project. A talking job dictionary that we then donated to uh, homes for blind kids. And they could hear, you know, Billy Bowman talking about the, the job of being a fireman, what its challenges were what its low points were, what its income cycle was, what you needed to offer as preparation to be able to compete for the job. I think it was 
a marvelous project. Obviously, it could be done anywhere. I never found a kid who wasn't completely absorbed in shadowing. And then, if you recall, when we talked about private schools, we talked about methods of access. It's a natural dovetail that if you decide you want to shadow a news anchor at a news network, how do you get access to that person and how do you convince them to allow you to spend a day in the station? If you decide you want to shadow a news anchor at a news network, how do you get access to that person and how do you convince them to allow you to spend a day in the station there. I'm thinking of one of our most famous shadowing episodes. Uh, a woman named Sue Simmons, as I'm going back about 15 years now, maybe 17 or 18, uh, was the hottest news anchor in New York City. She'd come from Atlanta, I believe, and she started out at five or six million dollars a year and and everybody was dazzled by Sue Simmons there. And one girl came to me and said, you wanted to shadow Sue Simmons? I said, <laughs> I said, boy, there's a tough one. Because if you write the network, Sue Simmons will never see the letter. You get a form letter back saying, we'd love to help you, but it's impossible given the blah, blah, blah. On the other hand, I said, if you can penetrate her personal security, if you can find out where she lives and make a personal appeal and offer her a quid pro quo, something for something, I said, you have a chance that she just might do this for you. Now, you can tell, I think, from my manner that, in fact, she succeeded, but not the intermediary steps, which took three months of hounding that poor woman and baking brownies for her and leaving notes at her building every other day until finally Sue must have thought the easiest way to defend myself against this girl is simply to do it. And when it happened, I said to the girl, now you've got to make good on the quid pro quo. I told the girl if she took... Uh, a still camera and she took slides of the newsroom and and a day with Sue Simmons in the newsroom and then she made a, a tape recording text that would coordinate with the slides. The duplicating slides is very cheap. In those days it was a, I think a dime a slide. So if she it took a 36 uh, image roll of 35 millimeter film for 350 we could get a dupe set of the slides and then a cassette tape was a buck you know and you could donate a day with Sue Simmons to every school in the school district there were 20 of them so your total expenditure on that thing is about a hundred bucks and what you've done is give each of the schools in the district the chance have a day with Sue Simmons to see the inside workings of the NBC newsroom. And you could also write a couple of pages on how you got access to this opportunity. Sue Simmons' name would be bandied about the Upper West Side of Manhattan, which is the media bedroom for the television industry. She could only come out of it smelling like roses. She had helped a 13-year-old public school kid. I have no doubt that some newspaper or other would have done a little feature article on it. So there'd have been a real quid pro quo here. And indeed, all, all those things happen. But it, it, it gives your life a kind of a, a treasure hunt aspect. It's amazingly exhilarating. You're constantly looking at the world you live in and saying, how could I create a way for a kid to penetrate that reality and produce a worthwhile project that would have interest beyond his or her own life and might really resonate down the years? 
So that's one of the things I did. Field curriculum, I called that. Uh, I realized that the lack of responsibility in these kids' lives was leading to a lot of the pathologies that, that I saw. To, to Not to be useful is to be useless. That's not just a play on words. It's true. You either have a function or you don't. You either have a function that, that's real, or you have a phony function, copying notes off a blackboard, or pretending that embedding yourself in this institution for 12 years is the only and best way you can develop your mind. That's nonsense, and we all know that. Uh, so I looked for ways to bring this about. The next thing I, uh, and, and the way I discovered was, apprenticeships. I rediscovered the wheel, what had been the staple of Western education, and probably Eastern too, for that matter, for millennia, apprenticing yourself to somebody who knows how to do something. Now, certainly I didn't have the power or the inclination to assign a kid for a year, but to assign a kid one day a week for a year which adds up to 40 days out of the school year, or eight school weeks, I thought was a fair exchange. And for those kids who were too emotionally inadequate to do that, I conceived of the one, two, or three-day apprenticeship, where someone would take the kid in and let the kids see what the nature of that, whatever that, that business or specialty was, and uh, explain to the kid how decisions were made in exchange for some service. I would tell the kids, if you just take and go away, you're not only a nasty human being there, this really won't stick with you. You always have to come to somebody with a quid pro quo in mind and say, if you'll do this for me, I'll do this for you. And, of course, kids will always say to you, kids can't do anything. But, in fact, there are many things they can do, among which I'd say the principal value is just to ask penetrating questions of an older person. Because all of us like to lay our lives out in the air so that other people can live schematically what we went through. Everyone loves to do that. It defines us. Uh, the next thing I did, but only for a few kids, maybe five a year, because it's much more difficult than an apprenticeship, you'll find that getting a short-term apprenticeship is very, very easy to do, much easier than you imagine. Uh, but Getting a mentorship where there's a, uh, like a family exchange, like someone steps in as a, a godfather or something, and for regular times each week, there's an intense personal relationship. Uh, these are much, much harder because the person committing to them will be aware that this isn't just something I can do with my left hand. Like to get an apprenticeship with an auto mechanic, you know, basically it's it's just to, to, to let the kid lean over the hood and see all these wonderful things being manipulated. And then the guy says, and this is this, and, and then you go on. But to open yourself the way a mentorship... Uh, cost, but it's worth trying because those are transformational experiences. Uh, then we did whole class projects. I said, what could 30 kids or 150 kids in some cases, what could they accomplish in one or two or three days that would make a permanent change or, or a visible change for, for the better in the life of the city? Notice here what we're really talking about is a sine qua non of citizenship, 
you have to take an active role in the community. That's what defines a citizen. So some of those were turning vacant lots into gardens. That's an old classic, and it never wears out. Uh, putting on shows or plays or variety shows for old age homes and for children's wards and hospitals and for veterans' wards at veterans' hospitals. The, the real trick is finding an audience. Kids are natural performers. They're natural hams. They love to do it, and they learn a great deal about ensemble work, about how to make your part uh, integrate with everyone else's part, including the lighting person and the costume person, the direction. Those are wonderful things to do. I would, at any given time, have two variety show teams traveling through New York City. And anything, banks, other schools, old age homes, were grist for, for our mill. Because any audience works for a set of performers who need to be immune to the audience, don't they? I mean, they can't say, oh, I don't want to play before. Those people, whoever buys a ticket is the audience. Can't predict that. But you do need an audience or you can't really grow beyond uh, uh, a preliminary point in learning this wonderful magical skill of becoming somebody else. There. Uh, so we started a food co-op every year. We found out where the wholesale market was. There will be one in, uh, wait a minute, I'm in Pasadena. There's a wholesale market around here somewhere where all the restaurants and food markets go early in the morning, like 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. or 2 a.m., and they buy whatever they're going to use in their work wholesale, and they bring it back. The people selling that stuff don't care who they sell it to. And for, with a few exceptions, they don't have one price for Team A and one price for Team B. These trucks come in and out of the city all night long. And somewhere around here is the wholesale market. Find out where it is. Take your kid there. Buy a quantity that'll set up a little stand. And the way we did it was we took orders through all the classes in the school ahead of time. And then what was left over, we set out on the, the main desk in the front office at 3 o'clock. Let me tell you, there was never anything left ever, not one piece left. Most of the stuff was pre-sold, pre of course, because you can offer people about a 20% break on their food uh, raw materials and it's much fresher than than if you pick it up through uh, through a food market because they they uh, cold storage a lot of the food the bigger ones will cold storage it for nine weeks before they sell it to you as fresh uh, I insisted on substantial community service one day a week. And that almost invariably was a loan. In some of these applications, you do not want a culture of children traveling together because then the experience is muted severely by the, the protective insulation that running around with a group of friends do. So so I did the bookings at first, but I said you can always book yourself and replace the placement that I, I got for you. So my kids one day a week would be scattered all over the 300 square miles of New York City. And if you say, wasn't that dangerous, didn't have a couldn't hold a hair to how dangerous it was just to be in the, the school. Uh, and in 
20 years of doing this, we didn't have a single incident, even though many of the placements and distances my kids traveled, I think you might think were reckless. I always cleared these things with the mothers ahead of time, but I didn't bother even to inform the school administration. Uh, parent partnerships on school time. Now, if you're homeschooling and you're watching this, uh, this is what you do all the time. But in the position I was in, I saw that the institution of forced schooling had as one of its logics that you would weaken the connection between the student and their family. So I tried to create a, a, a remedy for that. I said, you can always book yourself out of all your school classes for a day or two by drawing up a partnership with your mother or your father or your grandfather and setting out to explore some part of the city and to produce some understanding or or some service or whatever. What you have to do is design an application and I'll be as fair as I know how to be. If it looks to me that that was the equivalent or more of what I would have asked and expected from you in the days you were there, off you'll go. And I said, as a byproduct, you'll get to actually know your mother as a human being rather than as someone who makes breakfast in the morning you don't see again until evening. Uh, I had a standing arrangement that you could always exchange school time for starting a small business. And if you think there aren't a number of small businesses that kids have an advantage over older people in, then you're quite mistaken. They don't pay rent or upkeep. They can offer many services that are essential and substantially undercut professionals offering the same service. Think only of, well, Los Angeles is a, uh, is a city of homes, I guess. But New York City is a city of apartment buildings where you'll have 75 or more families living in one vertical unit. Now imagine that you have to move out of one of those places. Not easy to do. There's virtually no parking at all in, in a substantial part of the city without risking instantly being towed from the spot. And secondarily, the city's a bedroom community for many old people without families and often from spouses without their opposite gender number. If you're a 75-year-old woman and you want to move from the 14th floor to the third floor, you have an expensive proposition on your hands. But let me tell you, a team of 13-year-old kids can do the work three times as fast as a professional team, and you can pay them uh, a fair amount, but that fair amount will be a tiny fraction of what you'd pay. Now, here's a service that's utterly necessary, probably thousands of times a week all over New York City, and people grieve when they can't meet the terms of that service. Here's a a wonderful business that schools could encourage. How about pet sitting? What do you do in New York City with your goldfish when you're going away for three weeks? How about your dog? How about if you're going to be in the hospital for two weeks? Does everybody, as they do on sitcoms, on television, have a friend they can call and say, take the dog? I guarantee you, no. That isn't true, and many people would feel leery about asking a friend to do that service or frightened. Uh, 
I first learned about the possibilities in of kids and, and, and work as a substitute for curriculum when back in 1968 I learned of a 13 year old boy who was making twenty six thousand dollars a year walking dogs except he never touched a dog he booked the dog walking he hired school kids to do the dog walking, he trained them how to walk two or three dogs at the same time with one of those little appliances. And he took, I think, 50 cents a dog. At the time, his father was a postal clerk, I think making $15,000 a year. Remember, it's 1968, it's 35 years ago. And his mother had some other low paid income. The 13 year old boy was making more than his mother and father put together. His name was Brian Bantry, and he became a Broadway producer with his, his capital that he accumulated. Oh, my. Uh, there's just a few more of these. These are a menu of methods that can be substituted for standard academic curriculum but most of which, in fact, the standard academic curriculum can sit right on top of. You don't have to be mutually exclusive when you do these things. Uh, experiences with solitude. I knew from reading and from my own life that without the ability to be alone by yourself, that you're in for uh, quite a substantial amount of grief in your life if you don't learn to appreciate your own company. But you're also missing, I think, one of the developmental steps in having a reflective mind. Because the answers that come quickly, or the answers that come to you through brainstorming with other people, are not always, but most always, exceedingly shallow takes on whatever the question at hand is. You know, they may seem satisfying as they happen, but as you try to apply them, they're very often unsatisfactory. So you have to put yourself through, I don't think I'm telling most of you something you don't already know, you have to put yourself through a kind of an apprenticeship of solitude to break out of the box, to break out of ordinary thinking, even if it's high-level ordinary thinking. It's a trap. Uh, but how to trick children, and that I, I have to admit, how to trick children into doing something that I knew they needed to have practice with? Well, here are some of the ways. There is a reservoir system around New York City that goes from, oh, 10 or 15 miles away from the city to really 150 miles from the city that supplies the water through an elaborate system of aqueducts and tunnels. And all of those reservoirs are wonderful places to fish because no one fishes there. You can get a permit from from the city of New York. I don't think it costs anything. And you can fish in any of these reservoirs. I had a standing offer that anybody could take the day off and go fishing if they went alone. And that I had maps on the walls of where to go and another day to get down to City Hall and get a permit to go fishing. When I used to do that, it was uh, just pro forma, you know, you filled out some form and they handed you a permit to fish in the reservoirs. Uh, huge fish because of the, you know, nobody fishes there. Uh, and the reservoirs around New York City are, are enormous. I mean, there'll be 5,000 acre lakes and impoundments that are 10, 15, 20 miles long. So, so they're real lakes. That's one way. Uh, 
taking a hike. You want to get down to City Hall and try to get in and see the mayor or just watch the city council, which is a slam dunk. Uh, you can just do that. Okay with me. you got to walk from my school to uh, City Hall was about 10 miles. If that seems like an inordinately long walk to you, then welcome, I guess, to the 20th and 21st century. That would be a jaunt historically for people who wanted to get around. We've lost the use of our legs, and, and we've certainly lost, I think, the confidence that if you just put one foot in front of another, sooner or later you'd be in California. And... and not that much later. Uh, so that's another uh, way I arrange solitude. You could always go anywhere in the city and map a future uh, place that someone might want to visit. You could go to the court area and map the location of the courts and the entrances and so on. Or you could go up to Columbia University and create a map of of that campus that a kid could use with a little bit of acting ability to just walk on and live as a college student. We never got picked up doing that, and there must not have been a day when some of my kids weren't sitting in on law school lectures. They're all 13. Did they have any trouble passing as 19 or 20? No. I just told them, don't ever smile. Use a clipboard instead of a notebook and strike arrogant poses. I said, you'll pass the college student. Uh, the last three things I kept as colors on the palette, uh, or the last two, were utterly independent study, not where I participated in the creation of uh, of. Uh, a menu of alternatives, but where the kid from start to finish conceived the expedition and conceived the way to judge it. Uh, and finally, experience in how to kill time. I call it improvisational play. You got three hours to wait for your job interview. You're out on the winter beach at Coney Island. There's nobody else there, but there are waves, there are birds. There's sand as far as the eye can see and no people. You know, how do you fill these these bits of time? Because you're always afraid of, you see this as a cousin to solitude. If you're always afraid of uh, of, of doing these things by yourself, then you've become lifelong dependent. You're one of those people who can't be seen on the street without a cell phone, and I would cheerfully murder you if I thought I could get away with it. Okay, those are the 12 action themes of what I call the guerrilla curriculum. If you would like to operate as a guerrilla inside the, or underneath the radar of... Uh, of the government system. These are 12 ways to do it. Over the 11 years since I retired from school teaching, this will be, we're into the 12th, I had to find a way to distill the lessons that 30 years of classroom school teaching taught me. And for one of something better to do. I began writing books and going on an endless lecture tour, which has really taken me around the world, but it's taken me into every corner of the United States. Uh, the books that I've written during that time are all still in print, and they're available at my website which I believe I told you was my name with the three W's and dot com, or they're actually available from Barnes & Noble, but I'll sign them if you order them from the website. Uh, I'm going to show you in order 
the books I wrote and why I wrote them. The first book actually wrote itself. When I finished school teaching, I was filled with fury at the 30 years of my life I had devoted to this institution. I had trouble going to sleep at night because I was so angry and I had trouble getting up in the morning and greeting the new day. I woke up angry and I went to bed angry at night. So I thought I'd discharge some of this anger by trying to catch lightning in a bottle, trying to make the experience of 30 years fit into an essay called The Psychopathic School in which I described the pathologies I thought grew out of this kind of confinement experience. Uh, I had no sooner written that and used it as a, a Teacher of the Year speech when a little magazine reprinted it and somehow the magazine got to India and I got a call from Nehru University saying they would like to use the talk as a graduation address. And furthermore, they'd like to publish the talk as a, as a little book, a chap book, but that it was kind of skimpy to fill a whole book. Did I have a few other essays? that could wrap around it, could be a setting for the psychopathic school. Well, I thought about that, and it occurred to me that as I described the pathologies of, that, that school children display to an incredible degree, I hadn't written about my part in creating those pathologies. And so I wrote a second speech, which actually became the New York State Teacher of the Year speech, and it was published elsewhere. And soon there were 700 versions of it circulating the world there. So I had done a piece of the undone work by fingering myself and my colleagues and our, our role in creating these pathologies. There were other aspects of the school business that weren't so obvious as crazy children and crazy school practices. And I thought I owed it to a book to deal with those two. So in five different ways, I distilled my school experience and it became dumbing us down the hidden curriculum of compulsory schooling. And even though the publisher was a small publisher and never spent a nickel on advertising the book, word of mouth has caused to date 150,000 copies of this book to sell. The second book, The Exhausted School, and here you see me when I was a little bit lighter in weight in 1991, in white tie and tails, the only occasion for me ever to wear white tie and tails in my life, though I've worn a tux a number of times, this is on the stage at Carnegie Hall. Uh, I had just exited the teaching business in July. And I wanted some way to make a public mark, sort of to draw my toe in the sand in some public arena and throw down a gauntlet to the school business. Now it's bizarre to think of a junior high school teacher 
renting Carnegie Hall in New York City to do that. But I knew if the venue wasn't celebrated, I sure wasn't celebrated. So there wasn't much likelihood of this gauntlet ever being picked up and examined. Fortunately, some of my former students came up with the money to hire Carnegie Hall. If you're ever planning to do that, I want you to know that it's the most heavily unionized concert hall, I'm sure, in the world. There are thousands of pages of union regulations. If you go 60 seconds over the limit of your performance, you owe $15,000 more. If you want a piano on the stage to play a number, that's $6,000. We did pay that, and we had Mozart as the backdrop as the audience came in and during the intermission at the end as they went out. I said, as long as I'm going to get into a monkey suit of white tie tails, I may as well go whole hog. And anyway, it wasn't my money. is not that a school teacher for you? Uh, the Exhausted School wasn't a solo performance at Carnegie Hall. I drew together, I believe, six alternatives to institutional schooling that were up and running and were quite successful. And I wanted the audience to see that there were a whole variety of ways to do this education thing. So uh, my own words are about a third of this book, and the remaining two-thirds come from the Holt people in Boston and from the Waldorf people from their training college in upstate New York and from other examples of a different way to do this thing. The third book I wrote also wrote itself. This is an assemblage of speeches I made between 1992 and 1999, each one of which attempts to examine some aspect of this wacky institution. Now, every piece of this will resonate with some part of your consciousness if you went to public school. In other words, my goal is not to tell you things that you don't know in this book. It's, in fact, to have you ask yourself, I've known this for years. Why haven't I done something about it? Uh, I hope someday to combine dumbing us down and a different kind of teacher and have a, a book-sized book. The last book took... 10 years to write. I began it slowly in 1991, and by 1993, I was working around the clock, seven days a week, January the 1st to December 31st. It was the principal activity of my life, the underground history of American education, which is 310,000 words long, and in fact, at one time, was 600,000 words long. When I looked at this pile of TypeScript pages, I said, nobody is going to work their way through this book. So I picked out hunks of it and threw it away. But the 310,000 words that remain constitute a mosaic that adds up to an explanation of all the inexplicable aspects of schooling, from standardized testing to grading to a trivialized curriculum, and on and on. I worked 10 years of digging, at least 2,500 books, read many, many, many hundreds of interviews, lots of reflection, it's, it's a full-time job of 10 years. 
And oddly enough, I'm still working at it. The next edition should be out in 60 days. It probably will have the same cover, even though I purchased different cover art. I don't want to delay bringing this edition out. And the next edition has substantial changes in it, even though this earlier edition and the one that preceded it capture the argument and prosecute it the same way. I've I simply dug a little bit deeper. Also, I corrected the misspelled words and the bad grammar, which is very embarrassing for an English teacher. Uh, so I, I'd like to read a little bit of the table of contents of this book so you can get some sense of how it differs from from the first three were were really personal expressions based on on the site observations a bit of research more than a bit a fair amount but it was fresh from the job this is an old turtle's reflection on these the questions these first three books raised. And what I've done in the table of contents is to basically list the main ideas that are in each chapter in an old-fashioned bookish way. That I won't bother to bother you with. But I wrote a little epigraph before each chapter that tries to catch the kernel, the thematic kernel in that chapter. And those, I think, might whet your appetite to work your way through a 310,000 word book. The first chapter is the prologue, and the epigraph for the prologue is the shocking possibility that dumb people do not exist in sufficient numbers to warrant the millions of careers devoted to tending them will seem incredible to you. Yet that is the central proposition of my book, that mass dumbness, which justifies official schooling, first had to be dreamed of. It isn't real. First chapter is called The Way It Used to Be, and in that I attempt to reach back into American history and show the contrast between the expectations of young people growing up 200 years ago in this country, not globally, and what we're doing today. And the epigraph for the way it used to be is our official assumptions about the nature of modern childhood are dead wrong. Children allowed to take adult responsibilities and given a serious part in the larger world are always superior to those who were passively schooled. At the age of 12, Admiral Farragut got his first command. I was in fifth grade when I learned of that. Had Farragut attended my elementary school in Monongahela, he would have been in seventh grade. Chapter two is called An Angry Look at Modern Schooling. And the epigraph is, the secret of American schooling is that it doesn't teach the way children learn, and it isn't supposed to. It took seven years of continuous reading and reflection to finally figure out that mass schooling of the young by force was a creation of the four great coal nations of the 19th century. That's the United States, Germany, Britain, and France. Nearly a hundred years after the investiture of forced schooling in the United States, on April the 11th, 1933, the president of the Rockefeller Foundation announced to insiders that a comprehensive national program was underway to control human behavior. 
As I speak to you, that was 70 years ago. Chapter 3, the schools, of course, were the agency to do that. Chapter 3, called Eyeless in Gaza, is about the elimination of the ability to read complex material. And I specify exactly how that was carried out. Something strange has been going on in government schools where the matter of reading is concerned. Abundant data exists to show that by 1840, the incidence of complex literacy in the United States was between 93 and 100 percent wherever such a thing mattered. Yet compulsory schooling existed nowhere. Between the two world wars of the 20th century, schoolmen seem to have been assigned the task of terminating our universal reading proficiency. And to spare you reading this chapter, I will tell you that under the guise of World War II, the alphabet system of teaching reading, which had worked quite brilliantly and very efficiently for hundreds and hundreds of years, was jettisoned, and it was replaced with a pictograph system where you were required to memorize the look of words rather than to sound out the parts of words. It's a system that simply doesn't work well. It works well enough for you to become an indifferent reader, but never well enough for you to pick up the books that the people who made schooling were familiar with. Chapter 4 explains why I quit, how I eventually became disgusted with what I was doing, even though I was highly honored by the system and given many, many privileges. I became so disgusted with what I was doing that I quit. I lived through the great transformation of the 1960s and watched schools turn from reasonably useful places into laboratories of state experimentation upon children, centers of scientistic pornography masquerading as pedagogical science. Treating children as individuals became anathema. The changeover was the fruit of a half century of social theory in which experts in child development spoke in averages. But there is no mass of children, only individual children. The entire great scam of sociology dealing in social averages is a hideous way to look at your family or your neighbors. There are no average children, and all the stage theories of child development, depending on averages, will bring you to grief if you attempt to employ them either with your family at home or in school. The evidence of our eyes and ears demonstrate that average men and women do not exist. It's a statistical conceit that justifies management. In chapter 5, which is the second part of the book, I try to discover and uncover the foundations of schooling and also the kind of human temperament that would lead to this, this fashion of an institution. This chapter is called True Believers in the Unspeakable Chautauqua. I took the uh, locution True Believers from a, a book by Eric Hoffer, the San Francisco longshoreman who had a, a vogue in the national eye 
of about five years, and I believe the early 1960s. He wrote these very slim, highly intellectual, and quite fresh, freshly thought uh, considerations of American national life. And his last book, and probably his most famous, which has been continuously in print for the last 40 years, is The True Believer. The expression actually comes from uh, St. Augustine in a book about, uh, about war, I believe. From start to finish, school as we know it is a tale of true believers and how they took the children to a land far away. All of us have a tiny element of true believer in our makeup. You have only to reflect on some of your own wild inner urges and see the lunatic gleam that comes into your own eye on those occasions to begin to understand what happens when obedience to those kinds of impulse are made a permanent condition of management. Chapter 6 goes even deeper into this true belief phenomenon and examines the utopian impulse as it occurred globally, but as it particularly occurred in the United States. In the middle of the 19th century, we had well in excess of 1,000 utopian colonies all over the United States. And just, just for pure pleasure, I'd urge you to pick up one of the many books available that deal with the different sorts of utopian community. Because the experimentation on human nature that was undertaken in those communities was borrowed. It was abstracted and utilized by government agencies. The lure of utopia, presumably humane utopian interventions, like compulsion schooling, which is supposed, after all, to be for the good of children, aren't always the blessing they appear to be. For instance, the invention of the safety lamp saved thousands of coal miners from gruesome death, but it wasted many more lives than it ever rescued, because without that invention, the coal industry would have always remained a peripheral business. They would scrape the surface and leave the rest of it alone. The safety lamp allowed the subterranean depths of the earth to be dug out in little narrow tunnels and the miner to be relatively safer in those tunnels than he would have been, but if he hadn't have been able to see in those tunnels, he never would have gone into them in the first place. The lamp alone allowed the coal industry to grow rapidly, exposing miners to mortal danger from which there is no good protection. In the year 2000, after an era of safety lamps and other scientific progress, 6,000 miners were lost to cave-ins and explosions in Russia alone. That's twice the death toll of the World Trade Center disaster in New York. What Sir Humphrey Davy, the inventor, accomplished with his lamp was a great gift, but not to coal miners. It was a great gift to coal producers. Chapter 7 tracks the kind of schooling that you and I are familiar with right back to its original uh, production center, which was the militaristic state of Prussia in northern Germany. And from Prussia, delegations from all over the world, east and west, came to see the Prussian miracle, where a small, poor country could produce... Uh, profitable factories, and in particular, a very well-disciplined and formidable army simply by passing 
its citizen its young citizenry through forced schooling and from prussia horace mann returned to the united states and japanese investigators returned to Japan and they installed the Prussian system where it would do the most good from the managerial point of view. In 1935 at the University of Chicago's experimental school, this is the epigraph for chapter 7, the Prussian connection. In 1935 at the University of Chicago's experimental school where John Dewey had once held sway and made his reputation. The head of the social science department published an inspirational textbook called The Life and Work of the Citizen. In its pre-publication edition, and this is the one I'm talking about, because if you get the publication edition, what I'm going to tell you about will have been muted. The title page clearly shows four interlocked hands interconnected to form a swastika. And the markings throughout the book for the chapter divisions and also for inner chapter divisions are done with the fascist emblem, the bundle of sticks held by an eagle. By 1935, the Prussian pattern and Prussian goals had embedded themselves so deeply into the vitals of American institutional schooling that hardly a soul noticed that the traditional purposes of this pedagogical enterprise were being abandoned. If you remember from another part in this film, the traditional purposes were to develop good people good citizens, and to make each individual his or her personal best. Those were replaced by a fourth purpose that comes to us directly from Prussia, and that is that school would be, uh, school would be an assistant to the economy and to the government, and therefore school children should be looked upon as human resources not as individual spirits. I'm sure that to no one watching this will the term human resources not be familiar. That was the Prussian outlook on people. Chapter 8 nails the origination of forced schooling in the fashion that we have it to coal mines and the coal mining powers. A dramatic shift to mass production and mass schooling occurred in the very same moment in history and they are definitely intimately related with one another. Mass production actually isn't really possible, certainly not the way we conceive of it, without an endless source of energy, which absolutely prior to coal was not available anywhere in the world. Winds come and go. Water ebbs and flows. But coal power can go on at a steady rate around the clock. Suddenly mass production truly became possible. But to have people effectively work at mass production, and even more importantly, consume the usually somewhat inferior standardized products of mass production, you have to have a different kind of human being than through, than through the British out of the United States and were working for independent livelihoods in this country. This chapter, chapter 8, is called A Coal-Fired Dream World. A dramatic shift to mass production and mass schooling occurred in the same heady rush. Mass production could not be rationalized unless the public accepted massification. In a democratic republic, school was the only reliable long-range instrument 
available to accomplish this. Older American forms of schooling would not have been equal to the responsibility which coal, steam, steel, and machinery laid upon the national leadership. Coal demanded the schools we have, and of course oil, which displaced coal in the center of our affections also. And so we got these schools as an ultimate act of economic rationality. Chapter 9 deals with the kind of mentality which evolved in order to, to make efficient the heavy use of machine interventions in human life. It goes by the seemingly harmless expression, scientific management. And between 1890 and 1920, it was as close to being a national religion as anything you could imagine. Time and motion studies, which we have with us today, that determine that if a woman keeps her elbow at this angle rather than this angle, she will produce 20% less assembled pieces on the production line is just one of the hundreds and hundreds of, of relics of the scientific management period we have with us. What people who are knowledgeable about this usually aren't knowledgeable about is it didn't stay in the production arena, in the uh, industrial arena, but it leapfrogged almost immediately into the churches, into the schools, into every aspect of American life. Managers came to judge themselves and others judged the managers on the basis of how scientifically they managed. Frederick Taylor was the high priest of scientific management, and he's certainly somebody that you should delve into, read a biography or two, and you will find probably the principal architect of the world you live in. In the past, Frederick Taylor wrote, he was the uh, scientific management engineer for the Carnegies and the Rockefellers. In the past, Frederick Taylor wrote, man has been first. By the way, he also invented the slip-on shoe because it was more efficient than a shoe that had to be tied. Uh, in the past, Frederick Taylor wrote, man has been first. In the future, system must be first. The thought processes of the standardized worker had to be standardized too in order to render him a dependable consumer. Forget efficiency in production if you can't get efficiency in consumption. Now think about that for just a short instant. The most efficient consumption system would have people consuming all the time and expending all their earnings and all their savings on consumption. Have I described the United States at the beginning of the 21st century, but the only way you can get continuous consumption is by maintaining a constant low level of boredom so that nothing people buy is satisfactory for other than the first few moments after the purchase. Think only of your computer, which you know even if you bought it today as you listen to me, is already obsolete because none of the computer companies would release a generation of computers if they didn't already have the replacement generation in hand. Read Tracy Kidder's The Soul of a New Machine and find out where that philosophy evolved from. At the minute the sales curve for whatever the, the you know, the AC Ducey machine you bought is, whenever the sale curve reaches, is that called the asymptote, David, the top, 
and starts down, at that moment, the drums begin to roll for the generation that was available at the moment you purchased this generation. And it is tooled up and moved on to scene. Of course, its replacement, too, stands in the wings waiting for, for you to continuously consume and be dissatisfied with this machinery. The same thing's true of automobiles. It's true of everything because that's the logic of scientific management. You have to reach a point in human life where everything and anything machines make will be consumed enthusiastically. Well, they make an awful lot of stuff. Fortunately, the United States of America is there to consume it. Uh, chap the, that, that's the end of uh, the third part of the book. The fourth part of the book is simply one chapter. It's a personal interlude about my own family and upbringing in a coal mining town in western Pennsylvania. And if you had taken my family and put them under modern social work scrutiny. This is both my father's family and my mother's family. I would have grown up in social service work, in a foster home, and all of the people I knew who were all wonderful, wacky geniuses who fought constantly, they would have all been locked up. And if I were the victim of those things that I'm told victimize people when I read the, the, the various child-saving manuals, then I would not have been able to live an adult life, to own a farm, to become the New York State Teacher of the Year, to write four books, and to make a movie, to be married to the same woman after 43 years. The truth is, like schooling, our insight into, into the mind of the developing young, A, is based on averages. Even the averages are suspect there. I suppose I can't tell you that I believe that spare the rod and spoil the child is probably as accurate, as accurate a, a piece of folk wisdom as anything else. It's not 100% accurate, but certainly was accurate in, in, in my place. Nor do I look at anyone who applied the rod to my anatomy with anything other than love and gratitude. All right, that was my Green River. And, and why I throw that in is not uh, for some personal display, but simply to show a personal contradiction to, to sociological wisdom and psychological wisdom as it's been packaged and, and vended to us. Uh, Part four of the book is called Metamorphosis. I try to show the change from an earlier traditional libertarian society. It's interesting because that's almost a contradiction in terms. We hardly have a record of a libertarian society in the West or the East. Where the models came from were American Indian tribes who didn't have a ladder of authority the way Hollywood shows with the top guy having all the feathers in his hat. But very often the chief ships were exchanged. They were drawn by lot. And if that sounds bizarre to you, let me tell you that all of the leading positions in classical Greece were drawn by lot. If you wouldn't put your name in the hat or whatever container they use, then you weren't fit to be a citizen of Athens. And if they needed a water commissioner, all the citizen names were available, and the one they drew out was the water commissioner. And how about general of the armies? Exactly the same way. 
not a professionalized lifelong career, but it was assumed that a citizen would have the competency to do anything after a short trial period. And that to be a citizen, you had to have a crack at all the major responsibilities. Otherwise, you weren't worth dealing with. You were a slave. I think that might be a fresh perspective on the 21st century. Uh, chapter 11 is, call, is called The Crunch. And in, in it, I deal with the very rapid conversion from an older kind of society to, to what we have now after the American Civil War. Chapter 12 deals with how power really flows in the United States. It's one of my favorites. It's called Daughters of the Barons of Runnymede. And I picked that at random out of a book of, of elite hereditary societies in the United States. The Daughters of the Barons of Runnymede are not one of the most influential, but they're the ones that caught my heart and my tickled my funny bone best. You can't be a member of the Daughters of the Barons of Runnymede unless you can show direct descent from one of the 12 barons who forced King John to knuckle under to the nobility back in 1215. That's an American organization, but it probably has outriggers around the world. And here's the funniest part of the Daughters of the Barons of Runnymede. Just because you can show direct descent doesn't mean you get into the inner circle of the club. The only people who are allowed in the inner circle of the daughters are people who descend from one of the barons who had some special knightly decoration. The rest of them are just common fodder, even though they've traced their ancestry for 800 years. Now, my levity aside, there are extremely important hereditary societies in the United States. The Order of the Cincinnati is one of them. I'll probably be shot for even telling you about it. The Order of the Cincinnati is made up of those people who can trace their descent from a field grade officer in the American Revolution. And when it had its meetings after the Civil War, not only did every major northern general show up, but every major southern general showed up too. Uh, the new compulsion school institution was assigned the task of fixing the social order in place. But it, it borrowed the cautions the two Italian sociologists, Vilfredo Pareto and Gian Battista Mosca, had laid down around 1900. Both these men, working independently, said the reason that every uh, uh, hierarchy comes to an end is the problem of transmitting to the next generation the reins of power. And what causes this, these breakups to happen is that in reality there really isn't any difference in talent or intelligence between the aristocracy and the common herd. And as you frustrate the natural leaders of the common herd, they band together and over time, it may be centuries, they figure out where the weak spots of your edifice are, and all of a sudden they upset it. And both these men, working independently of one another, said that the way out of this trap is to put young children through every stage of their life under close scrutiny 
And the minute you see signs that someone might potentially become a later adversary, you draw that kid into the reward system of the aristocracy. You flatter that kid. You wean that kid away from his own parents. And in that way, the secret of perpetual power would be available for the first time in human history. So the next time you see some kid from Harlem on the cover of Time magazine on his way to Exeter or Andover, you might just ask your local librarian to get you Mosca or Pareto. But the daughters of the barons are running me represent the over well over a thousand uh, private hereditary societies that are really like a cousinage, an international cousinage that exists apart from almost any form of scrutiny the outgroup can bring to bear. Uh, chapter 11 is it's called The Crunch, and in it I deal with the very rapid conversion from an older kind of society to, to what we have now after the American Civil War. Chapter 12 deals with how power really flows in the United States. It's one of my favorites. It's called Daughters of the Barons of Runnymede. And I picked that at random out of a book of, of elite hereditary societies in the United States. The Daughters of the Barons of Runnymede are not one of the most influential, but they're the ones that caught my heart and my tickled my funny bone best. You can't be a member of the Daughters of the Barons of Runnymede unless you can show direct descent from one of the 12 barons who forced King John to knuckle under to the nobility back in 1215. That's an American organization, but it probably has outriggers around the world. And here's the funniest part of the Daughters of the Barons of Runnymede. Just because you can show direct descent doesn't mean you get into the inner circle of the club. The only people who are allowed in the inner circle of the daughters are people who descend from one of the barons who had some special knightly decoration. The rest of them are just common fodder even though they've traced their ancestry for 800 years. Now, my levity aside, there are extremely important hereditary societies in the United States. The Order of the Cincinnati is one of them. I'll probably be shot for even telling you about it. The Order of the Cincinnati is made up of those people who can trace their descent from a field grade officer in the American Revolution. And when it had its meetings after the Civil War, not only did every major northern general show up, but every major southern general showed up too. Uh, the new compulsion school institution was assigned the task of fixing the social order in place. But it, it borrowed the cautions that two Italian sociologists, Vilfredo Pareto and Gian Battista Mosca, had laid down around 1900. Both these men, working independently, said the reason that every uh, uh, hierarchy comes to an end is the problem of transmitting to the next generation the reins of power. And what causes this 
these breakups to happen is that in reality there really isn't any difference in talent or intelligence between the aristocracy and the common herd. And as you frustrate the natural leaders of the common herd, they band together and over time, it may be centuries, they figure out where the weak spots of your edifice are and all of a sudden they upset it. And both these men, working independently of one another, said that the way out of this trap is to put young children through every stage of their life under close scrutiny. And the minute you see signs that someone might potentially become a later adversary, you draw that kid into the reward system of the aristocracy. You flatter that kid, you wean that kid away from his own parents, and in that way, the secret of perpetual power would be available for the first time in human history. So the next time you see some kid from Harlem on the cover of Time magazine on his way to Exeter or Andover, you might just ask your local librarian to get you Mosca or Pareto, but the daughters of the barons of Runnymede represent the over, well over a thousand uh, private hereditary societies that are really like a cousinage, an international cousinage that exists apart from almost any form of scrutiny the outgroup can bring to bear. Chapter 13 was the, is called The Empty Child, and that was originally the title of this monster book, The Empty Child. It has to do with the contributions of psychology and philosophy to this, this pot of this leadership pot. The basic hypothesis of utopia building, and of obviously what we're running is a utopia here. May not be a utopia for you, but let me tell you, it's a utopia for, dare I say, the Bush family or the Clinton family. The basic hypothesis of utopia building is that the structure of personhood can be broken and reformed again and again that people are plastic or that they're empty and can be filled according to specification. The notion that children were empty vessels was the most important concept which inspired social architects and engineers to believe that schools could be remade into socialization laboratories under central mandate. Chapter 14, in some ways, is my favorite chapter in the book because it originated in a speech I gave immediately after the Dalai Lama spoke in Boulder, Colorado. And I had sat directly in front of the Dalai Lama, staring in his eyes while he spoke. And when he was done, I got up and spoke to a tent full of people who I think paid $500 a ticket to get in, certainly not to see me. But I was inspired to reach some kind of height beyond the ordinary. I must have taken 90 days to write this talk. It's called Absolute Absolution, and it deals with the necessity of throwing God out of government schooling. God was pitched out of government schooling on his ear after World War II. This was not because of any bogus constitutional prohibition, at least not one that the previous century and a half could detect, but because the new state and the new economy considered the Western spiritual tradition too dangerous a competitor to be allowed, and of course it is. When you issue a wild card to every citizen, 
that says you may appeal beyond the decision of our managers and experts to an invisible guide, you're dealing with a situation so unstable that sensible architects knew it had to be gotten rid of. What I'm most proud about in this article, though, is is you can't just throw God out. What you have to do is find a way to replace the functions that God serves. I, I can't give you a religious lecture here, but obviously one of those functions is to deal with the inevitable universal aging, sickness, and death that we all will encounter. But you can move into place a large, minutely articulated medical apparatus and system that more or less, without actually saying it, promises that everything can be taken care of, including death. It's just a matter of time, isn't it? until we don't have to die. It seems to me I hear that message daily from the medical system. And there are other things, that, the functions. God holds your hand when you realize that paying the penalty of, uh, of uh, the forbidden fruit in Genesis, that you're going to have to labor by the sweat of your brow for your bread. Well, no, you don't. You live in the United States. Only fools work. Don't you get stock options or aren't you in a privileged occupation where the idea of, uh, uh, of, of your resources shriveling up don't exist? They constantly renew themselves there. You don't have to work. Only fools work. Smart people have other people work for them, or they employ machinery. We're not fighting a war in Iraq. Our machines are so superior to the Iraqi machines, which, by the way, we sold, sold them. So it's our new generation of machines against our older generation of machines that I think we should award the medals to our machinery in, in, in appropriate ceremonies. Anyway, absolute absolution deals with the problem of God, why spirits are dangerous, and what actually the Western outlook on, on religion teaches. It's, it's, it's an amazing code of easily accessible strengths. Chapter 15 is the psychopathology of everyday schooling. None of the familiar school sequences, none of them, are defensible by any of the known rules of evidence. You could not bring a case to court that this has to be this way or the division into social studies and so on has to be that way. They're quite indefensible. They're all arbitrary because you have to do something as long as you're going to confine these kids. They're all grounded in superstition or class propaganda or aesthetic or philosophical prejudices of one sort or another. For instance, and this I think will be directly useful to you if you're a, if you're a homeschooler, Pestalozzi's famous formula of simple to complex is a prescription for disaster in the classroom. This is not the way people learn. They learn from a kind of random selection up and down the ladder that keeps them feeling the zest of the chase. And sometimes, very often, you can reverse the ladder, and it works just as well. In fact, there were famous experiments. I have to tell you this. I hope I can remember the name. If I can, it was... Penn State University in central Pennsylvania, in the years I believe were the middle 70s. Uh, 
I'm reaching, but this old mine. But these are quite famous experiments. The Pennsylvania State University Psych Department took the physics textbook for freshman physics, which I believe was a required course so that all freshmen had to take it, and they scrambled the pages at random, mind you. So often you'd get to the end of a page and you'd be on a different concept in the middle of a sentence than the former concept. And they applied that. This is some more evidence of the way schools are used as laboratories of experimentation. They applied that to a few sections of the freshman physics course, and everybody else got the regular, careful, simple to complex ladder system. On the standardized examinations that measured supposedly proficiency in physics knowledge, there was no difference at all between the group that got a textbook that was made up of pages that had just been put together at random versus the ones who had the scientifically organized and, and a rational thing. But I had too much experience with kids, and I had too much bad experience with simple to complex in my own life and also my teaching career, not to say, you're nuts if you buy that bilge. Uh, the last part of the book is called The Prison of Modern Schooling. And chapter 16, I believe there's 18 chapters in my book, so we're near the end. Yes. Chapter 16 is called A Conspiracy Against Ourselves. Spare yourself the anxiety of thinking of this school thing as a conspiracy, even though the project is riddled with petty conspirators. It was and is a fully rational transaction in which all of us play a voluntary part. That is, you can step off this treadmill at any moment you want and actually do this education thing the right way. You can just step off the treadmill and, and walk away. It was and is a fully rational transaction, and you play a voluntary part in it. You trade the liberty of your kids, as all of us trade our free will, for a stable social order and a prosperous economy. Now, I want to modify that a little bit. We had a prosperous economy in every single phase of American history. It's just that the corporate economy is much more prosperous than the economy of independent livelihoods, which is to say more stuff is available and more legal tender to buy the stuff with is available under the corporate system. The cost is your mind and your character to have that extra bit of stuff. Uh, The society is much more stable than it would be because no one knows how to rock the boat, or very few people know how to rock the boat there. And when you look in earlier periods of American society, it was always turbulent because it was supposed to be turbulent. That's what they failed to tell you in social studies that the whole American charter is meant to provoke constant argument. It's meant to make doing anything that changes the past difficult to do. It's a test of whether it's really worth doing that we make it so hard to do. For the Supreme Court to cooperate with the White House, to cooperate with both houses of Congress, is a nightmare. That's exactly what we fled when we came here. Of course, you can't argue very effectively unless your mind is developed and your understanding and your insight, unless you can 
speak in public and write in public. That's why we don't bother to let you know how to do those things, even though they're child's play to do. Because then you'd be able to argue effectively. You would restore the America of Andrew Jackson. Who wants that? Not Unilever, I can tell you. Not Coca-Cola, I can tell you. Not General Dynamics, I can tell you. Why would they want that kind of competition, that kind of obstructionism? So it's a conspiracy against ourself. You and I have entered into a devil's bargain in which most of us agree to live our lives through as children. We may be a little bit less childish than the actual children, but not much. The self-same tutelage which freezes the young into place in exchange for food, entertainment, safety, political simplification affects both the grown-ups here and the adults. The contract fixes the goal of human life so low that students go mad trying to escape it. Of course, the struggles are largely over by the end of the teen years. That has nothing to do with the claims of hormones and biology. It's the light that goes out of your eyes or goes out of your house pet's eyes when it realizes that it's never going to be allowed to go out into the world. Chapter 17 is the nitty-gritty. It's the politics of schooling. And I wrestled with this idea for literally years trying to find some way to communicate the brilliant invention that keeps us static, that keeps school reform producing the same thing we had before we reformed the schools. At the heart of the durability of mass schooling is a brilliantly designed power fragmentation system which distributes decision-making so widely among so many warring interests that large-scale change is impossible without a guidebook. You have to know who actually holds the actual string of power. I'll give you a hint. It's never the teacher's union, regardless of what you hear. Ain't true. The power's fragmented into 18 separate compartments, that I, each one of which I talk about in the book. People who accomplish modest-sized changes in the system have a map to know which people to waste time on and which people to avoid, even though they seem to be at the center of power. For those of you out there with a gleam in your eye saying, I've heard that idea before, you're right. You heard that idea in Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, written in the first quarter of the 17th century, in which Hobbes says that wherever power seems to be, that you can be sure is not where it is. And the whole shtick, sort of an Eastern Yiddish word, the whole shtick of getting anything accomplished is actually not to beat your head against the ladders of authority because they don't lead to the authority. It's to discover where the authority is and home in on that. So the politics of schooling. And of course, each one of these compartments of supposed power have to be paid off. That's why these these darn government schools are so expensive. I'll give you just one example from my experience. Uh, in the last school I taught in, uh, I was given a former science room on the third floor of the building for my room. I'm saying a former science room 
on purpose because those huge slate uh, tables with uh, sinks in were still in the room. But sometime during the school year, some the custodian came in and removed all those desks. What he didn't notice, or probably was just indifferent about, is that the legs had been embedded in the floor, and when he removed the desks, in some places there were holes that went straight down to the next classroom. And so my kids, being an enterprising lot, would make spitballs and, dare I say it, would even wad up used toilet paper and drop it through those holes into the screaming class beneath. Eventually this reached the principal's ears and he came to my door and he said, I demand that you stop that. And I said, I ask for permission to stop, but it would have taken 10 minutes. I'd go out and buy some patches, and I'd put them down myself over these holes, and that would be the end of the temptation. But I was informed by the custodian that that was illegal. So he stormed out of the room, and then he came back, and he said, right, you have to go through the chain of command. Okay, I said, start me on this procedure of getting these holes repaired. But don't ask me to stand over these holes because they're all over the room. And if I look one way, the stuff will get down another hole. They were dropping also ball bearings down those holes, which is really smart when they bounced off your noggin. So the custodian wouldn't tell me this, but eventually by dint of gruesome research, I discovered how many sign-offs had to be made before a team was dispatched from 25 miles away in Brooklyn to come and fix that repair. Eight separate levels of authority had to sign off on that, beginning with the custodian of my building and then the principal. But there were still six hoops to jump through, and then they didn't come. I misspoke. They didn't come to fix the holes. They came to inspect the problem. I want you to know that the whole procedure took eight months for work that any journeyman could have finished in a half an hour, including purchasing the supplies to do it and duplicate that experience by thousands and thousands of repairs in, in, in the thousand-odd schools in New York City that are under the central system. And now are we just beginning to see a glimmer of how this power system has been set up to guarantee that nobody can change the inexorable progress and product of mass forced schooling. Absolutely fascinating. The last chapter is called Breaking Out of the Trap. And I'll just read the epigraph. The only conceivable way to emerge from this trap from which no further human, oh, I found a typo, progress is possible is to repudiate centralization of schooling in the form of national goals, national tests, national teaching licenses, school-to-work plans, and the rest of the utopian package, which in California is daily being tried out here and there. You guys are you guys are among the most villainous states in the country. I'd say the only one that matches the damage that California does is Texas. 
home of the legendary, well, I won't say it, this isn't a political program, uh, you dictate textbook construction for the whole United States, and the reason for it is simple. Rather than fragment textbook buying so that teams of salesmen would be traveling constantly all over the state trying to sell their product, you bulk buy for this nation of 35 million people so that anyone who gets a contract to supply California with books gets a contract to supply California with millions of books. It's instant wealth. Well, because of that, no textbook publisher wants to make 19 versions of his book. What California wants, or what Texas wants, because they do the same thing, is then force-fed to the rest of the United States. And what you have wanted for all my lifetime is not in books that train the intellect. You've bought wanted books that propagandize the spirit, that socialize children. Your books are riddled with airs, some of them so comic that if I say them, you won't believe them. When I went to my first uh, job away from uh, the East Coast, it was in Portland, Oregon, and the textbook that was available for history the high schools of Portland, Oregon, was the same one available uh, in California. It was by Scott Forsman. And among the 258 major errors in the book was that the United States had dropped the atomic bomb on Korea. Now, we're probably likely to do that in the upcoming days, but, but certainly I guess they felt that all those people from that part of the world look alike What's the difference? Japan, Korea, uh, there were hundreds of errors of that magnitude in the book, nor was there any particular consternation when this was exposed. I guess there were some screams on the part of parents. But what does it matter? you, you got to get the kids to sit, be quiet, copy notes off the board, and pass tests. What does it matter whether the information is accurate or not? How old-fashioned do you want to be? Breaking out of the track, you have to repudiate centralization. Schooling must be desystematized. The system must be put to death. Rather than dismissing that as rhetoric, each one of us, if you value individuality, has a system of our own, just as we have a fingerprint of our own there. It's not totally alien to everyone else's system, but the part of our lives we value is in fact the part that that stands apart from the other people we know, or at least that's the part we should value as Americans. When you force everyone's system into one large system that presumes to distribute rewards later on based on how well you conform, we're talking about a nightmare that we are the chief distributor of this nightmare to the rest of the world, not communist China, not ex-communist Russia, but us should make you sit up and steam and vow to sabotage this system any way you can any way you can. So that's the last chapter in the book. It says, Adam Smith correctly instructed us, you know, the high priest of the libertarians and the conservatives, he correctly instructed us for more than two centuries that the wealth of nations is the product of freedom, not of tutelage not of someone telling you this is the right way to do something. Smith said that the more people you bring to the bargaining table, the more likely it is that in that steamy exchange of points of view, 
but an entirely different idea that no one had thought of before springs free as the resultant of this dialectical process. I've never met somebody who cites Adam Smith, and they're all over California, who actually read his books. And while you're reading Wealth of Nations, which says bring everybody on board in a policy sense, read his theory of moral sentiments, in which he says that the people who devote their lives to making money are insane. They have wretched lives as a result of that, but we should all thank them for having devoted the substance of their lives to con constructing these structures that produce rivers of wealth. As I said, I've never met anybody, but I'm only 70, who's actually read Adam Smith. He's well worth reading. Uh, so, so the connection between the corporate economy, national politics, and schooling isn't a disease of free enterprise. It's a disease of collectivism, which must be broken if children are to become sovereign, creative adults capable of lifting a free society to unimaginable heights. The rational management model has damaged the roots of our free society and the free market that it claims to defend. And then I have an epilogue. That's only two pages, but you only get a little bit of it. What happened in our schools was foreseen way before we had them by Thomas Jefferson. We have been recolonized through the 20th century in a second American revolution. We have been reabsorbed into the ruling imagination of Tudor England. It's time to take our script from this country's revolutionary start. It's time to renew our traditional hostility toward hierarchy and tutelage. We became a unique nation from the bottom up, not from the top down. That's the only way to rebuild a worthy purpose for American education and a worthy destiny for our children. And I summon on stage in the epilogue two people. General Braddock in charge of the largest British army in North America and his subaltern, Major George Washington. Braddock is an aristocrat to the core and he's on a huge white horse and he's covered with red and gold and silver and drummers and Washington is dressed in frontier buckskins on a horse called Blueskin with the gray. And both of them are beckoning us into a different future. One says, you are children, you will always be children, we will take care of you, follow me into this well-organized, fully ordained future. And Washington, who said in his memoirs that the most brilliant sight he ever saw in his life was Braddock's army, about to be exterminated when it crossed the river that Washington said, I don't think I'd cross that river if I were you. He made a mistake, because in my reading of American history, when he looked in the mirror, that was the most brilliant sight he ever saw. Like Caesar, he was offered a crown three times, and three times he turned it down and said, I'll return to private life after my presidency. I think we need to follow Blueskin 
into the future. And that's Underground History of American Education. And I hope you buy it. <laughs> Thank you very much, John.